I understand there is a very strong teaching in the Torah that Hebrews use looking for their God to deliver them, Isaiah 11, verse 11 and 12. So this is going to take us back. And uh, that's similar to the Messianic belief in Israelitism as well as Christianity that a Messiah is going to return. I don't know why he didn't get the job done the first time. But Hebrews are looking for the deliverance from their 400 year captivity having come off slave ships although they can't get the 400 number quite correct they can't quite tie it down but at least they do say they're in captivity still and how do they get 400 years when the captivity of 400 years is supposed to fulfill the curses of Deuteronomy 28 even though Abraham had spoken of uh, supposed 400 years. But all the captivity must still fall in line with fulfilling the curses of Deuteronomy chapter 28. And in Deuteronomy 28, as it speaks that you'd be going on ships and so on, I don't know why it's breaking it up like that, because the captivity seemed to have started when northern and southern kingdoms went into Assyrian and Babylonian captivity over two and a half thousand years ago. So to highlight 400 years, like there's something special about that, like why isn't two and a half thousand years being highlighted? It is because you can handle 400 years because it seems so current, so close to now but if you tell somebody that you've been in captivity out of your land for two and a half thousand years or more they'd be like your god isn't coming back you can't sell people that kind of gospel so doctrines of deception try to use arguments that make you feel like What's being taught is more current because then you can connect with it. Especially that if you have been in captivity for two and a half thousand years or 2,700 years, and then Jesus came a couple hundred years after that and died on Calvary and he came for salvation, the salvation listed in Luke chapter 1, verse 67 to the end, that he will basically be doing this whole Calvary thing to deliver his people from those who are oppressing them, then it kind of makes you wonder why are you trying to be delivered from 400 years in 2019 when the deliverer came in the first century to deliver you from a captivity that you were in from Assyrian and Babylonian times. So you have to talk in more current terms of 400 years. Don't talk about the 25, 26, 2700 years since Assyrian and Babylonian captivity. But in assaulting God for this lesson, I want to talk about the absence of this God as explained in the scriptures where it lets you know if a God is absent, he is not even God at all or cannot possibly deliver. And if the shoes fit, like they say, then hey. So if God is having his foot slip comfortably, properly, into the shoes of non-deliverance based on no presence and no activity, then it's game over for the Torah. Psalm 115, verse 4 to 9, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands, and have mouths, but they speak not. And that reminds me of Jeremiah 10, and about verse 4, and you go on where the Most High is saying through Jeremiah, there, the whole Christmas tree argument there, 
don't be afraid because it must needs be born. This tree god cannot do anything. You have to prop it up and to move it, you have to walk with it and carry it. So it's not a real god. So he says it's just silver and gold. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. Now, it's funny that this god seemed to have had a mouth in the days when the scribes were, were up and running and writing the Torah and the prophets were speaking. But this god does not speak today. You have to read a book today. But he speaks to no one in any way where we can verify. See, when the Most High spoke in the Torah days, when the Torah was being lived out, people could prove, could verify, even with Moses going up to Sinai in the world of the book. If God spoke, it could be verified. Because as one rabbi said many years ago when I was still in the Christian church, and I had no idea that there were Hebrew Israelites who were black and who was the Negro living on earth. Many, many years ago, this was like in the 90s, one rabbi wrote a book. I don't remember the book or the name of the rabbi, but I was reading it in the library. I was reading crazy in those days about Jewish stuff, but I, I read it all in a Christian mindset. So it never occurred to me that something was wrong with believing in New Testament salvation. But I would just take it just to learn the Old Testament stuff and use it in a New Testament Christian kind of way. But this rabbi author said, it's not just Moses, but every Israelite should have come away with their own revelation at the bottom of the mountain. Just like Moses got his revelation on top of the mountain. So, you could verify as an Israelite at the bottom that this God was speaking and doing something. Because when it was all said and done, a stone with writings on it was cast down to the Israelites to smash up their Baal bull worship that they were involved in. They could also hear the rumblings and thunderings and there was, you know, the smoke and the presence of God on the mountain. No Israelite would have denied that God was speaking and finger of God was writing and so on. They could tell. Right, So when God spoke, they could tell when he even spoke. You see, you don't even have to be in the presence of the person, the prophet, who is actually hearing God speak to know that God speaks in the Torah, if you are living in the Torah days. Because when he spoke to Moses, when Moses was in Midian, the Israelites were not there. They were still in Egyptian bondage working as slaves. And they were not there to hear God speak to Moses up on the mountain and to see for themselves the bush that burnt with the angel in the fire. They were not there to see Moses throw the, the stick down that turned into a serpent. They could not see and witness all of those things. But even though they were not in the proximity of all that was going on with Moses and God in the burning bush, they could still verify that God spoke to him because when he got to Egypt, there was activity that showed, that proved, that verified, that was making a witness out of them of things that they had not seen with their eyes. So it is not necessary to see something in order to be a witness in the Torah worldview. But they'll tell you today that you know, like, yeah, if you see it, you're a witness. Well, you, in the Torah mindset, you don't have to see something as long as God can be verified in some kind of way by you. But now, in 2019, the Israelite who is in captivity, all they can do is read a book that was printed by people who they say are their enemies. But that same Israelite, they just read and they buy another book to verify some of the, the concordances, lexicons, and so on. But they're just reading. They never get to verify with activity from God that God spoke. They can only verify that a story was written some long time ago because they have a book that is telling them that they bought from the store that such a story took place. But they're not verifying the activity of God. They're just verifying the writing of a book that continues to be printed in modern times. So they have 
book verification, but no God verification. Printing press proof, because they can prove that in our world there are printing presses, because how do we have these printed books? But they cannot prove in modern times that there is a God named Yahweh, the God of the Hebrew Israelites, that did anything at any time because they are not able to prove that he is doing anything at this time. So it goes on here to say, they have mouths, but they speak not. And I can just inject here so you can follow me through a little bit better that uh, they have mouths, but they speak not. They have books that they read only, but no mouth that they hear speaking. They just read a book. But they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. So the Israelites could hear a prophet speak, just like a prophet who was an Israelite back then could hear a voice speak and they could say, that must be the Most High. They could also, as prophets or as Israelites, with their eyes, see the activity of God. They can see the Red Sea splitting. They can see pillar of fire and cloud by day and night. They can see all these fancy things. They can see with Elisha, an axe head floating. They can see all kinds of miracles. They can see a chariot going up with Elijah to heaven. They can see. They had eyes in the Torah so they could see, verify, believe, and move on to knowledge. But today, there are mouths, but they speak not. They have eyes, but they see not in 2019 the miraculous power of their God. It is only a book that makes them believe, but no activity from the God so that they can move from belief to knowledge. So that they can know their God, so they only believe. Verse 6, they have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. And you see, this is the God that is the false God, the idol that is being speak, spoken of. But the understanding here that I'm bringing to you is that what is true of the God must be true of the people. So if it was the verse 5 mouth of idols that do not speak, sure words, provable words, and the eyes of the idols that do not see, then it's also the truth that the mouth of the Israelite cannot speak the word of their God, but only the word of a book. And that the eyes of the Israelites cannot see the miracles of God because God isn't showing before their eyes. So whatever is true about your God would be reflected in the people that worship that God. So that's why in Isaiah 43.10, the Most High said, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he before me. There was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. And verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no savior. I have declared and have saved. I and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. So you see that whatever is reflected in the truth of the God that speaks and that shows with the eyes to be able to see would be reflected in the knowledge and the life of the people. So that he says, I have declared, so he has a mouth so he can speak. And he has showed it so that eyes can see. So the Israelites can both speak and see and show the things that the real God does so that they can be witnesses. So he creates witnesses and then they become a reflection of what he does in what he speaks 
so they can verify it and in what he shows so they can see with their eyes to verify it. So then, because he has activity, they can be witnesses. So activity creates witnesses. That's why the Israelites in the scriptures could put down the other gods because they knew that their gods, the idol gods, could not show anything, do anything, say anything. So their, their people cannot be witnesses in a real sense. So in modern times, if the God of the Hebrews that come off slave ships is not showing anything and not speaking anything, how are you witnesses? When you have not heard his voice and you have not seen his miracles of deliverance. But he said in Isaiah 43, I have shown it. I am the Savior. I, even I, am the Lord beside me. There is no Savior. He's letting you know he has shown his salvation so you can see it. So that's how you are witnesses. Verse 7. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them out like unto them, so is everyone that trusteth in them. That's what I'm saying. They that make them are like unto them. So whatever is true about your God is reflected in the people. How the people live is a reflection of their God. When Israel was living right and they could not be defeated, it was a reflection that unlike the other gods who did not have feet, to win battles for them and so on then the Israelite God he was real so that was reflected in them getting the victory verse 9 O Israel trust thou in the Lord he is their help and their shield so this is describing a real God of the Torah Yah who does things he has activity Let's keep all that in mind in the context of 1 Kings chapter 18. I'll read a couple of verses. Verse 19. Now, therefore, this is Elijah and Mount Carmel, prophets of Baal. Now, therefore, send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, which eat at Jezebel's table. Then verse 22, Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now verse 25 to 29, And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under and they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning, even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. So notice that they're getting no answer from the God, but they embrace the altar more. They threw themselves more. Just like, you know, when you're not getting a, a word from God, for whatever you're dealing with and you're not getting delivered from Babylon 2.0 so you say let's do a, a 24 hour prayer vigil all over all Israelites everywhere and so you go and just like the Christians do their all night prayer meetings and you're trying to unify this prayer and whatever and, and seeking the most high for his people who are in captivity so you throw yourself more upon the altar. You throw yourself more into the word and into seeking the most high. So the moment you have to throw yourself more into it like that, you got to wonder, is this God real? Is he even hearing? So they leaped upon the altar, which was made. So they're not getting a response yet. They go deeper into worship and believing this God. Instead of taking the screwdriver and pulling apart the altar or pulling apart the Torah and seeing if there is anything inside it. Is there a God inside this altar? What's powering this altar or what's powering this book? Or who is powering this book and this movement? Verse 27, And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Elijah mocked them. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure 
he sleepeth and must be awaked. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any that regarded. So they cut themselves, ruining their bodies, you know, like the heavy metal poisoning of the water and so on, that's ruining your organs, binding to your organs and so on, while you sit down waiting and trusting in God. Imagine that. Ruining your bodies with all the stuff you are eating when you should be delivered by now after 2700 years or so and you're still ruining your bodies with eating the food of Babylon and your God can't deliver you. Damaging your organs with all the food that you're eating, the air that you're breathing in, and so on, the, the, the stuff spraying on your, your foods, your vegetables, and so on, pills that destroy your blood vessels, your arteries, and so on, right? And, and you're destroying your body in a system that you say is a blessing from God, because some Israelites say that they left Assyrian captivity and came to America. And in the land of blessing so that you could more properly keep the, your laws and worship your God and you are further being destroyed. So they cut themselves. They're destroying themselves. So the end of that is that worshiping their God brought no deliverance so they ended up being destroyed. Destroyed. They're, they're starting to die now because if you leave them alone, there will be so much blood they would just end up dying, even though Elijah killed them later on. So when they got no answer from God, death came later on. Either it was going to come by too much cutting of themselves, or by Elijah cutting them or killing them himself, which is what ended up happening. Evening time, when it says it went until the evening time and there was no answer, it says it's late in time. Time is far spent and still no answer. Just like you're still calling on Yahweh, but it's now evening time in the world. Evening time for us. Where there's climate engineering grabbing us by the throat. War is creeping up on us. More people are saying the war is coming to North America. And so in the evening time, you cannot get any response from your God. But Elijah is saying, cry loud. Maybe he's on a far journey. See, the text with Elijah itself assaults this same God of the scriptures. Because Elijah is teaching you that if you do not get an answer from God, then something is wrong with that God. He is not the real God. But the God that answers, let that God be God. And don't tell me, well, you're in captivity, you're not righteous yet. You are supposed to be because that's what you tell people that they should be righteous right now by turning back to the laws. And in the scriptures, Israel was sinful in Egypt and they still got delivered. So how right do you have to be to get an answer from God to be delivered right now? The text itself is assaulting God. If your God does not answer you, to end your 400 year captivity after so called slave ships, it is because he is on a far journey or maybe he is sleeping. So, if he is sleeping or on a far journey or whatever your excuse is, the end result of that is that he is not speaking and not showing you deliverance. If he is not speaking, it is because he has no mouth, and if he's not showing deliverance, it is because there are no eyes that can see your plight. So he does not deliver you. And in the end, your eyes also reflect what's going on with your God. So that your eyes also does not see the salvation of God. Cry loud. Because 
your God is on a far journey or maybe he is sleeping. Who knows, maybe he's just sick. Your God then, in 2019, acts in no way different from the other gods that Elijah was cursing and from the other gods that the Israelites back then would put down and curse. Because your God is no different from those other gods, this Torah is just a man-made story. You just heard my new lesson, Assaulting God.